Yep. Right. Let's go. So I'm, I'm Alex. Uh, I work at Red Hat. Historically, it's, it's in the desktop group, so I historically work on L related stuff, GTK, GBFS, Jillib, Nautilus, things like that. But the last, say, two years, I've been working on this project called Blackpack, uh, which is basically apps on the Linux desktop. And obviously we do have applications on the Linux desktop. We use them every day. So when I say apps, I mean more like the iOS, Android style of apps. Uh, not necessarily the uh, walled garden part, but the other aspect, technical aspects of apps. So I have a couple of major goals. Uh, first thing is I want cross distribution across different versions of distributions, deployment and distribution. I want to, or I, I want the upstream maintainer of his app to make a build of their release, put it somewhere, and then everyone from any distribution, any version of the distribution should be able to download it and it should run. The same bits. The one bits, the bits you tested is the same bits that your users would run on any uh, distro and if they like update the version of their distro it will keep running because it's the same bits. Uh, secondly, I want sandboxing. Clearly not all Linux apps will like instantly be perfectly sandboxable, but sandboxing is a, is a very big part of the design. So we will allow some kind of sandboxing and we also allow things to be less sandboxed. But there is like a path towards perfect sandbox ability. And then the, the last thing is kind of a non-technical goal, but I want to lessen the distance between the developer, like the upstream application developers and their users. Because right now, if you are the GIMP and you do a new release, when do your users get the new release? I mean, it, it, it depends a lot on what they're running. I mean, some, some really core people can like download the tarball and build it, but most people do get it from their uh, distribution. And if they're on a slowly moving distribution, they will basically never get it, like until they rev to a new distribution version. But I want to be in a place where the day after the developer do a new release, the users will get the new thing, because then they will report bugs against the currently you know, stable release. They will not report ancient bugs that were fixed two years ago. If they have feature requests or, or changes, they will be against what's currently doing, being developed. So, and, and the hope is that this, is, this will basically increase uh, the velocity of open source development, which I think is really important. Making it more like say, the web environment, where you can just push stuff and people have it, you can test it and fix stuff in it. So, shorter iterations. And it's like, another goal is that it shouldn't be a very technical experience. This is what I imagine most people will see when they use Blackpack. Uh, this particular example is GNOME software, which is the GNOME App Store kind of thing. But uh, there's also Flatback backends for the KDE uh, app store, or software installation thing, uh, and also a couple of others. But basically it looks the same as the current one. It just has a different backend. So you click on something here, you get nice data, you get nice descriptions, there's ratings. A single button doesn't say Flatback or anything. You just click on it and it installs. Well, uh, there's a progress bar and stuff, but basically it's a non-technical thing. And when it's installed, it's just part of your desktop as if it was a, a, a dev or an RPM that you installed. Uh, you, you launch it like you would any other app. There's nothing in the UI that says this thing is a fat pack. It just looks like a map. Uh, Obviously, we also have a command line tool, which does say Flatpak in it. So here is basically the equivalent. This top here is the equivalent to what we did before in the UI. 
Well, it's actually not quite true because the 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 you know, software example kind of cheated. Uh, Flatpak is fundamentally decentralized. There's no if you install Flatpak, there's no apps. Like you have to add. Like if you install a distro, there's always a default set of things you can pull. But Flatpak doesn't really come with a distribution of things. So you have to add a repository. So this, this here just adds the GNOME repositories. And if you, once you do that, you will, that will then all the apps there will appear in your GNOME software or equivalent. And then we can install. Here is one major difference from how uh, apt and done would work. Because we have to specify the source where we're installing the stuff from. Whereas in a typical distribution model, you just say install this thing. And it will look in all your configured uh, repositories. But we expect there to be like multiple remotes installed, much more so than in, in, in a distribution model. Uh, so there's a level of trust in which remote you pull things from. Like if you install this, it shouldn't be from some third party thing that you installed a game from. You shouldn't be getting your other apps from there. So the source of the app is always a trusted thing. You only get updates from that remote in the future. Uh, you can run things. You can get updates for it. There is the alternative way to install it. Or you can like click on this link in a web browser and it would just install it. Which is basically a, a small text file that describes all of that. The, the difference is that doing this will not add these remotes as publicly available, and they will not show up in in, in your uh, GNOME software or whatever. Uh, you would just get updates for this one app. So, how does this work? Flatpak is very much uh, reliant on something called OS Tree. How many people know about OS Tree? It's not. It's quite a lot. It, it's Originally designed for entire operating system, uh, GNOME uses it for their continuous integration framework to produce like completely built tree every you know every commit basically. But it's also used by uh, Fedora and Project Atomic to do uh, atomically updatable uh, operating system, and it's a lot of interest from the embedded industry to use it. I think there's like a Qt module for. Uh, deploying uh, using OS3. But we use it for apps instead of uh, operating systems. But still, an app, an operating system, is basically the same. So the design is basically a straight rip off of Git. But the main difference being that the thing you normally commit is an is a entire root of operating system binaries. So there, there are some small changes in how it stores things in the repository, uh, because Git is not very efficient for large binaries. But fundamentally, it's very similar. You have a repository, you have a local repository, you have branches in the remote, you can pull the branch, and you can get a local copy of it, and you can check that out. Uh, and, and in the case of Flatpak, every branch of the remote is a separate app. So, uh, uh, you can think of a, a, an OS3 remote as a Git remote, but every, every branch being its own uh, app. And uh, there's also an extra branch, which has collected metadata for all the other branches, which is what we do for, for the uh, UI and the, like, basically the app store thing. It gets app stream is, is a free desktop format for uh, metadata about app release information, screenshots, all that kind of stuff. And we basically take those from every branch and create a big one. And then you pull that regularly and then you have all the information. And AppStream is already used by Debian, Fedora, so it's most apps already have descriptions in this format. And like if you don't, it's easy to add. So if you do a Flatpak install, what happens is that we have a local uh, repository. Just like you do in Git, there's a .git directory, which is basically a local directory, or a local repository. 
and we pull this branch into the local directory, or the local repository, and then we check out of it. Uh, typically in Git, you always, or not always, but most of the time you have a .git directory with always connected to the checkout. You can actually run it on a mode where you have one bare repository and checkouts to a different directory. And that's the kind of model we have because we do a one repository and one checkout per app. So we check it out to a different directory and then this like ends up with just a directory of files and one of one of the one of the directory called export has a bunch of exports that we copy and do some minor rewriting on into a global directory where we integrate with a uh, desktop. So I don't know how much people know about how the desktop work, but dot desktop files are basically how you launch apps in in the Unix uh, environment. And we have icons and deepest integration and things like that. And and, and that's the way it integrates with uh, Richard Shell or Plasma or whatever. And it, there's a bunch of code we get from this, but there's also some very nice parts about the design of OSG. First of all, it's based on the same model as Git, which is content address storage, meaning every file in every app is stored by the name based on its hash of its content. So any two files from any two apps are stored, as long as they have the same content, they're stored in the same place, and they're all stored only once on disk, only once in page cache, and if you pull something from the network, if you already had, have the objects locally available, we will not download that again, even if it's from some entirely different app. And, and when I say checkout, the checkouts we do are actually hard links back into the repositories. We're not like, duplicating the storage. Uh, also, all updates are atomic. Uh, OS3 itself is atomic. Basically, when you do a pool, you download all the objects that are just you know, files based on the content, name based on the content, and at the end you change the branch to point to the latest tip. And the same with the checkout. We check out not over the currently existing one, but next to it. And then we do an atomic switch of a symbolic link. So it's atomically, now whenever you run this, it's now this one. And if the old one is currently running, it's kept around until the last instance exits, which is really nice because like, if you were ever, I don't know if it's on most distros, but at least on Fedora, it keeps, Firefox keeps breaking all the time if you do updates in the background, like some, some Zool file changes and it can't handle it and it breaks. So you have to restart it manually, but that will never happen because the old thing is always there until the last instance goes away and every new instance is always from the currently active one. Um, here's an example of how a checkout will look for a really trivial application. So it's just like a regular directory with regular files. This here's the binary and it has some bunch of libraries and apparently some data file it needs. There's an exports directory with stuff that integrates and there's a metadata file that has some Example. Uh, this is a simple example. Um, this here is the application ID, which is basically the name of the app in a dbus slash java style like reverse domain name form. And all the exported file has to have the name as prefix, so there will never be any conflicts in the global namespace. And then when you run this thing, we use container technologies. I kind of try to avoid the name container because people tend to conflict this with Docker and server-side container stuff. But it's using the same kernel features. And in fact, it uses a program called Bubble Wrap, which is a project that I kind of extracted from Flatpak because it's used by other people too. It's more like Shroot on steroids, but also uses uh, namespaces and other features to further sandbox your stuff. Um, 
The difference between bubble wrap and Shroot is that any regular user can use bubble wrap safely to make their environment more contained. It cannot be used to break out of anything. Shroot is root only because you can use it to exploit set your idea things, but that's, that's perfectly safe with bubble wrap. So it builds up this entirely different view of the file system, so that uh, the, the app instance never sees the real file system. Instead, it says it's whatever files it shipped are always available in the slash app, and something called a runtime always supplies slash user, and basically everything else is invisible. Except there's this directory, I mean, it's stored in this pad name, but the fact that you can access it doesn't mean you can access the rest of the home directory. Just this particular directory, where, which is by default the only place you can write. At least, like, that doesn't, you can write to temp, but that's only a RAM file system. So it's really nice compared to some other systems. You don't need relocatable apps. You can always just build with slash app prefix, and every, every app will see its own files. So every slash app is different, but the file name is always the same, which means it's very easy to build typical Linux desktop apps. You just configure them with a different prefix, and they just work. If you look at Snappy, for instance, which is kind of an alternative, you have to like figure out environment variables to make it find itself in weird prefixes and stuff. But this always works. This work. Uh, and then we have this thing called a runtime. A runtime is what supplies that user when the app runs. So it, in a very real sense, it's like a distribution. Because most of your distribution is in slash user. Uh, but it's not a distribution in the sense that it has everything in it. Like there's no init system, there's no kernel, there's no hardware support. There's no X server. It only has the minimal dependencies that your app is going to require. And by dependencies, I mean direct libraries and data files that you load. It, like, in a sense, your app might depend on the X server, but that's just via some like C. Everything your, your app loads or directly starts has to be in the runtime, or if it's not in the runtime, it's in the app. So it's much much smaller than a distribution, but still kind of a distribution. Uh, every application gets to decide what version they uh, what the name of the runtime they want to use is, and what version it is. So there can be multiple runtimes installed, however however many you want, and they can be multiple and used parallel, even different ones. They're like isolated. And the runtimes are also basically the same as the app. You just play buffer, buffer. It doesn't have the exports because you don't typically run these directly. But this minimal example is probably enough to run the, the Hello World thing because it has libc and some kind of like loader stuff. But uh, typically you had also have, since we target desktop stuff, a bunch of data, locales, icons, Maybe you know small help docs and yeah, fonts, so things that, are, that other than libraries that you also are going to need. In fact, it's almost certainly there's a libc. There's also probably, I mean, it depends on what the runtime. It's probably also your typical shell tooling, like there's a set binary and grep binary things that make shells work, basic libraries, like the, yeah, the X libraries and OpenGL libraries, but also, and this is one of the major reasons of doing the split, everything that's security sensitive should ideally be in the runtime so we can update it separately. So crypto libraries, codex, image loaders, compression libraries, file format parsers, all the things that you know, tend to attract weird bugs that affect network communications and things like that should typically be in the runtime 
because then app developers, because if, if anything is not in the runtime, you have to bundle it with the app. And you don't want the app developers to be responsible for OpenSSL errata or something like that. So that's a huge part of why we have the runtime split. And in fact, I think it's important to talk about what a runtime is and is not. Because a lot of people have a tendency to think of everything in terms of distribution packages. And a di distribution package is fundamentally something different from the runtime you have split. Package dependencies are created for technical reasons where you want to install an app and you need like a minimal set of dependencies. But a runtime is not a minimal set of uh, dependencies. In, in some sense, it's like a maximum set of dependencies. The things you see as important core, and you will always get all of that. The reason instead is it's a structural organizational change so that two sets of people can work on the same thing, or work on this thing separately. Like, one team can maintain the runtime and not have every app developer have to do security updates and things like that. So don't like try to create your own runtime, basically. Unless you're a major company or like major organization that can take on the burden of doing maintenance of, of essentially a distribution. Uh, as an app developer, you have to then pick a runtime. And this is a young project, who knows exactly what will happen. I hope there will not be a multitude of runtimes, because like, then we reproduce the whole distribution fragmentation system. I want the distribution to focus on the operating system, which is what they're good at, and like have a minimal set of dependencies for the run or a minimal set of runtimes. But generally, it turns out there are two kinds of runtimes. Ones that are kind of minimal, which by being minimal, you can kind of make them supportable over a longer time. We have one called the freedesktop.org runtime. And as you can guess on the name, it has most of the stuff from free desktop. So there's X in there, there's Misa, GStreamer, Gbus. There's also some game stuff in there, like SDL and Pulse Audio. The really core desktop stuff that tend to be stable over a long time. So, we can, so it's supportable over a long time, but an app might need to bundle more on top of this. But some apps don't. This is a great like use case for a game that doesn't have a lot of dependencies, or you know, Maya or some third-party proprietary app that but like, don't use the latest and greatest free software toolkits. And then we have the larger runtimes. KDE is doing a runtime, Gnome has a runtime. Uh, it's unclear exactly how the KDE one will work, but. The GNOME, GNOME one revs every six months with the major GNOME releases, so there'll be you know, a constant churn of new runtimes, which is fine because most GNOME apps also follows like the release cycle and pick up new dependencies on the latest. So even though we cannot support old GNOME runtimes longer than like a couple of years or something, most apps will probably follow and keep using the latest one. Especially since it's free to like you can rev your dependencies without forcing your users to upgrade their distribution. So it's much simpler to update your dependencies because you don't have to have any like minimal dependency set because it has to work on every distro. You can just pick the latest one, make sure it works, and it will work for everyone. It's also a different kind of runtimes that we have been experimenting with, like for instance in Fedora, we're thinking about rebuilding all our current packages, or at least like a subset of them, as flat packs. And then we basically have to pick some subset of Fedora and make that the runtime 
and then whatever other dependencies your app has has to go with the app. So that's not a kind of runtime that you want third-party apps to rely on, but it's a way to repackage existing packages. And then we have sandboxing. Linux and Unix has this tendency to be thought of as secure. And I guess that's true in some sense. But the security model, or the threat model it's based on, is different from what you really need in a desktop environment. It's great if you have a shared workstation in a university lab or a shared sort of server in a, like a, a university or a project in a company. But on my machine, I am the only user. I am root. It doesn't really help to protect the machine from anything. The really important stuff on my machine is in my home directory. And everything I run in, in, in my session has full access to that. So if I run a game, it can impersonate me on Facebook. It can read my mail. It can Twitter in my name, tweet in my name. It, it just basically has no use of this protect root against my UID. It just doesn't affect anything. So we want to have a way to basically introduce another layer inside the running session where we can isolate apps from each other and then apps from my files and my, my data, basically. So this is especially important because in the Flatpak model, we are likely to have multiple uh, third-party people delivering the apps we use. So we need to have, to have less trust in the sources of software we download. But basically, if you, if you run any distribution, you 100% trust everything they do. Because you automatically download packages that run scripts as roots in the background on your machine. But we can't have that if we just add a remote from some game developer that has some new cool thing. We cannot give them that kind of level of trust. In fact, we don't run, ever run arbitrary code, non-sandbox and flat pack doing installation. Uh, we want to have apps that don't like intermingle or conflict with existing files. You can just delete the app and it's gone forever. And we want the ability to do things like not let it like, send mail or do network uh, access at all. And to do this, we use container technologies, there's namespaces. File system namespaces is the fundamental one that lets us rearrange the view of the file system. But there's also other ones like uh, user or UID namespaces where we can see make it not see other uh, users. There's the pig one that makes it not see other processes. Uh, there's a IPC one that lets us not like, it's, it's about shared memory and, and yeah, system five IPC stuff. And also network namespaces that lets us isolate the network uh, from one app to another. There's the not very well known but fundamental flag called PR set no new cribs, which is the basics of having a shoot like thing be safe. Like shoot is currently root only because it plays with the file system view and some um, set URD or otherwise trusted things trust that if they look in slash Etsy, it's actually the Etsy password, not something you fooled it to be. So once we set this flag, we can never ever get any increased pri privileges. Like it basically makes set URD not work or anything like that. Uh, we also use seccomp, just to scroll filtering to remove P-trays, weird network things that nobody should use but have had problems in the past. Uh, and I think perf is disabled by default. And some other things that are likely to be problematic and unlikely to ever be used. 
Actually, uh, ptrace is kind of useful for debugging, so you can optionally enable it, but by default, it's not there. C, -group, we, C groups are hard to use in a non-privileged setup, so we do kind of use it if you have system D use running in the user session, but it's not, not really, any, nothing is really designed around C groups. I'm hoping that the, the next generation C group work fixes that, but seems to be always somewhere in the future. So given that we can basically do nothing, how do you do something? First of all, you can basically statically request, I want to be able to do more things. Like the app can, in, in its manifest, say, I want network access. And when you install, I mean, currently we used to always install. Eventually we want to add, because right now most apps are not really sandbox, but eventually we want to have an Android-like thing where if you install this app, it will require these privileges. And you can choose not to install, or you can override the position, but then probably the thing might not work. Uh, all, all the infrastructures that do all this are just not shown in the UA right now in a great way. But you can request access to network, OpenGL. You can see, I want to see the user's home directory or even all the files. I want to be able to, to show UI stuff or show the, produce sound and get a microphone input. There's actually always access to Dbus, but we have our, our, our own filtering dbus proxy, so the default access on the bus is very limited. You can own your name so that others can talk to you, but by default you can't really talk to anyone else. But you can request access to specific services on the bus. And, and I think this is pretty much the, the old style Android model, which is necessary for some things, because some of these things has to be set up like before the app even starts. <laughs> but in the future, we want to move to more dynamic world using something we call portals. Portals is just a name. But what we mean by portal is a service that runs in your session, meaning that it's not sandboxed. So it's, it's a trusted service that your sandbox applications are allowed to talk to. So it's typically, at least in the current setup, use, using Dbus to, to talk to it, but fundamentally it could be something else. The important thing is that this has a small interface to it, and the interface only exposes things that we are deem as safe in like some kind of high level I mean, typically, they are safe because they do some kind of user interaction. It's easiest to do an example. Like we have a file chooser portal. So an app wouldn't normally have access to the user's home directory. But it's, if it's, say, a PDF viewer, that's kind of shit because you want to actually be able to show a PDF. So we, we then have the file chooser portal. And the app asks the file chooser portal to let the user pick a file, and then the user picks a file from the portal. And the portal is not sandbox, so it can see all your files. But the uh, PDF viewer cannot like, see the portal doing its work or control it. So outside of the app, a file gets chosen, and like the user clicks OK, and implicitly grants privileges to your app. You're not allowed to read this one file. And then we have, hand it back to the app, and it can read it. And you know, depending on what, what it wants to do, we can probably uh, save a new version of it and stuff. But only that file and nothing else. And this is secure because A, the user is probably not going like, to randomly select an important file that he didn't want to expose. And B, if an if app were to use this to try to attack the user, it will like show you a 
file chooser when you didn't expect it to. And a file chooser, if you don't want it, you can always close it. So there's always like a way to cancel the interactive operation. Uh, that plus uh, the fact that you won't be choosing any problematic files makes it safe from a point of view at least. And the other way is for uh, the portal can always tell who's doing the request, like what app is actually requesting this. And it's easy to have a list of things, like a whitelist in, say, a uh, geo position portal, so we can look at the calling app and say, this app I was configuring in, in my de desktop or something, that this particular app can get my fine grain position, and this other app can see my coarse grain position. And if you can't see anything, you can always report that we don't currently know the position. So it's the data you get for the portal depends on your permissions. But the, the interface as such is safe because, you know, there's probably a UI in the, in the control center somewhere where you can grant individual apps uh, different uh, permissions. So that way you can expand, extend what the sandbox app can do. And we have a, currently a small set of portals. Uh, it's not a lot, but it actually is mostly what apps need. So there's, there's a low level thing called the document portal, which is some infrastructure to let you do the per, per app, per file permission checks. So there's a low level thing used by the file choose portal. There's also a show URI portal, which means if you have an about dialog and you click on a on like a link to your homepage, you want to open the browser, but you don't want to bundle a browser in your app. So you want to use the system one, but you cannot see the system. So it's kind of a way to open up that, and, and you would, you will always get a dialog that says this app wants to show this. Yeah, but around what 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 web browser do you want to use? And then you can pick one. And then I think the GNOME backend actually after a while remembers. So initially you have to like always pick something, but I think after a while it lets you just always open that URL. We have a print portal, so you can print do the print dialog outside of the app, meaning the app doesn't see the list of printer, it doesn't talk to the printer. It just, like the dialog runs outside of it. Uh, in the end, it just like produces a PDF and the other side prints. Your network status for basically like shim for network manager status, proxy configuration. And these basically look at the app's permissions and if you have network access, it just lets them get that extra data. The, the desktop portal itself is uh, non-UI, but there are backends, one for GTK and one for KDE. I think the KDE one actually was merged into Plasma like this week or something. Uh, and depending on what desktop you're running, it just picks the current one. So as an effect of this, you should be getting native, like desktop native file choosers which might be nice for some. Others might be more interested and more pissed off. But. So I think I can have time to talk about this. So building apps, uh, since flat packs are used like directories of files, if you have a binary, you can just put it there and commit the thing to an app. But a more typical way is to build the app inside Flatpak itself. So every runtime is paired with a runtime called the SDK, which is all the files in the runtime, plus the tooling needed to build stuff against that runtime. So it has the compiler and whatever tools, but also the headers, the like .sl symlinks, and all the, all the stuff that will be in a devel package on a distro. For everything in the runtime, corresponding develop packages in the SDK. And then we have this command called flatpak build, which is like flatpak run, but it runs in the SDK and it doesn't have to be an installed app. You like 
you, you basically create an empty directory for your slash app, and then it runs something in there, and you can just make install, and it will end up in that directory. That's kind of the very low level. And then we have a higher level app called Flatpak Builder. That's basically a layer above this that, that makes it easier to package stuff. Uh, so you have a, a JSON manifest describing the build, like some global properties, and then a list of modules that you need to build. And it adds a bunch of extra features. It so like automatically downloads, and verifies checksums for your sources. It has a cache if you change something at one module. It would want rebuild everything up to that point. It runs in like a heavily sandboxed environment, so anything on your build machine will not uh, affect the build. So you get like clean builds by default. It also builds in a specific prefix that is host independent. So, so it, like the PS subdirector here, and it runs make there. So all the pat names and stuff that gets embedded in your files are the same no matter what you build it. it automatically creates the bug. Like extra things you can install for the bug on locale information. It has some built-in compiler cache support. And, I think it's, it's JSON. JSON is not the perfect file format for this, but it's pretty simple to use. This is an example of building a GNOME characters thing built on the GNOME platform with GNOME SDK, with this uh, runtime version. At the end, we want to grant access to the X socket so we can talk to X. And once we've built all the like the binaries, and we're done with everything. We can just get rid of all the static libraries and include files and stuff. And then uh, the modules is on a separate page. Uh, basically, you specify a bunch of sources, checksums for them, and we will verify them. And if your app is like a typical autoconf build, you don't really need to specify anything like this. Uh, here you have an extra cleanup for apparently that module is called a binary we don't need, so we delete all the binaries from that uh, that module. Uh, we need some extra configuration options. If your build is more complicated, you can add more sources. You can add patches and you know post install snippets that you run after your build and whatnot. But it's basically pretty simple linear list of things to build. And we're starting to get a lot of traction. Most major distributions now ship the Flatpak. Even like Ubuntu have the latest, uh, latest stable Flatpak and, and uh, the previous release and also the new one that just got out. Uh, it's not yet in RHEL, but we hope to get there soon. But there's a copper if you want to install it on the side. KDE and GNOME are interested. Uh, there's a company called Endless Mobile that does an entire their own like third world com cheap computer thing, which is entirely based on Flatpak for all the apps and OS3 for the entire OS. LibreOffice do like, official Flatpak supported releases. Xamarin Studio, the uh, mono branch of Microsoft uses Flatpak for, uh, you can install the latest uh, from there. VMware has expressed interest. We're currently sort of working on this thing called FlatHub, which is meant to, I think it's an advantage that FlatHub is entirely decentralized, but as a user, it's not necessarily a good user experience to install it and then not have anything you can use it for. Like you have to find all the different repositories. So we're creating like this one site called FlatHub where we hope that most upstream apps, of like open source apps, will eventually be there. So you can, by default, have something that you can add one remote and have everything in your uh, UI to just easily install. And fundamentally, we want if possible, the actual upstreams of the individual 
projects to maintain their app in there, rather than like the, being another distribution. I guess we're basically close to 10 minutes for questions. Yeah, 15 minutes. Any questions? Um, if, if an application is building, uh, is built using a Qt, uh, Qt framework, uh, where's uh, all uh, that uh, package? Um, uh, or it uh, doesn't have to be uh, a UI framework like that, but, but the, most of the dependencies it feels like uh, quite a lot of uh, shared objects and uh, this stuff uh, ends up being packaged together with a... Uh, with application? Yeah, maybe yeah. because uh, it, uh, in, in these runtime say it was just libc and... Uh, ah, in the example ones, I mean, in the, in the GNOME one, in the GNOME room, we, we do have the entire GTK stack. And you could depend on the KE runtime, even if you only use QT. Because, you know, even though you're not using it, Many of your users might also have KDE apps installed, so and also Qt is a large part of uh, KDE in terms of size. But on the other hand, Qt is like designed to a large extent to be bundled with apps. It's also easy to build your own Qt that has only the features you want, and you know is exactly the version you tested against. So it's up to each. Individual developer to pick, however. Like, I have packets, I have flat packs of Spotify, and like, clearly that includes Qt. But a. But there needs to be a Qt runtime. I mean, yeah, or maybe the Qt packages are better off helping the KDE runtime people. Because for desktop, maybe. Yeah, I mean, they're near enough for desktop use to be. There could, could be a, like a minimal Qt one, uh, clearly, yes. But, but I think for regular Linux desktop apps, it was probably a better if, if QT, pure QT apps still relied on the KDE runtime. Because there's less overhead of maintaining two things. Can, can runtimes depend on runtimes? No. Okay. So they're meant to be self-contained? Yeah. Know. Well, there is something called extensions where you can sort of add to a runtime. So we have uh, like a um, extension point in the runtime for a GL driver. So you can sort of replace the GL, which you have to do, because that's how OpenGL currently works in Linux. But, uh, also, we have a concept of SDK extensions where you can Instead of having to do an entire new SDK because you need a Rust compiler and it doesn't have a Rust compiler, you can sort of add one on the side and it appears inside uh, or next to the runtime. But there's no, it, it's not a packaging system. It doesn't have a DAG of dependencies and you really, you know, for a solver and all that. Basically, leads into the other question. You said that Fedora is, in Fedora, you're looking at that app, uh, having flat pack is packaging Fedora yeah. apps. So would Fedora just become a, basically a minimal distribution with just the main dependencies for the system, or? I, think, I mean, that, that's a tricky question. Uh, what Fedora wants is very much what the people involved in Fedora are interested in. I think the current plan is, first of all, to like, just test it and make sure it works and, and make sure the infrastructure works so it's possible to use it. But I think eventually, and I think Call of knows this better, it's the kind of it's up to each package owner to decide how they want their stuff to be packaged. So uh, I think that so uh, the plan with Fedora is uh, is basically that uh, Okay, I think it works now. So, uh, so in Fedora land, um, um, 
as with uh, with many distributions, uh, there's there's lots of different stakeholders and people who actually work on Fedora, uh, and um, uh, but we have one group called Fedora Workstation Group that puts together uh, like the the, um, the Fedora, Fedora desktop uh, distribution, and uh, in there we are planning on uh, on having a like uh, basically only shipping the base operating system uh, in one format and, and then having uh, all apps uh, uh, in Flatpak. So so basically just taking all Fedora uh, RPMs and uh, repeating everything as Flatpaks and uh, having them uh, side by side uh, for a while and see how it works out. And uh, I guess depends on how well it works out. It, uh, we will see if, uh, if like the whole of Fedora project uh, picks this up or not, but it's the um, current short term plan. Yeah, and, and I think this is interesting because I think I think the current ecosystem is all wrong because the distributions for, should focus on what they do best, which is provide a operating system, which is like for a desktop, it's what you boot into, what you log into. It should not be about how many third-party apps you manage to package. But right now it is. Like, someone else can make a great operating system, but you would still like pick Fedora or Debian because the one app you want is not packaged in it. And I think the focus should be more on making the experience of running your operating system or maintaining it or you know, getting updates for it should be what distributions focus on, not how many tiny free software apps you can package in your repository. But if, if all of those could be shared between distributions, you know, the distributions could focus on the important stuff, not packaging crap. Yeah, I have a question back there. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. uh, I guess you have to repeat the question. Yeah. You see oh, we mostly, lost the mic? Or? Yeah. Uh, uh, you see this mostly as a desktop? Thing or also for servers. So, I mean, yeah. you could Apache into Flatpak, or do you keep that uh, in Docker if you want to containerize it? Yeah. So the question was: Is, is this a desktop only, or can it work for server stuff? Like, it's technically possible to run whatever as a Flatpak, but it's really designed for a desktop. There's, there's no. I would not recommend using it for, for Apache or something like that. I mean, it might work for a small command line thing, but running, running it ha doesn't have all the infrastructure around server stuff that Docker has. Like, there's no, the network setup is really basic. Either you get full network access or no network access. There's none of the magic binding of ports and exposing port and connecting up. Uh, containers, there's no tracking of the currently running containers. So basically, yeah, it's basically a bad fit. In the same way that Docker, like I've seen people run desktop stuff in Docker, but it's a poor fit. And, and the same way for, for running server stuff in, in that pack. It's just, it's not meant to do that, so it will never really work well. Uh, you had another question? Um, so, if I understood correctly, the application has to specify what runtime they want and what version. But the point of the runtime is to be able to update oh. the navigation. And, and by version, I mean kind of major version. So, like you would say, I want GNOME 322. But it's a security issue in GNOME 3.22, so we release a 3.22.1 or something. In ADI compatible updates, you get that. But you can pick like 3.22 or 3.24, and you get two, two streams of, of updates, basically. So is theme support coming too? So if you have. Yeah. yeah. Another theme support. Which is really just how the runtime is configured. So you can basically install currently GTK and Icon themes as a separate entity, and like do Flatpak install this and that theme. 
there's also some support where the host operating system could inject its own themes into it in the same way. But it's still some stuff that needs to be done for it to work perfectly. Like we need probably need work uh, in GNOME software or equivalent to automatically install the matching theme that you already have running on your desktop. But, you know, we're moving towards having that fully automatic. Like we sold the OpenGL driver solution where it kind of detects automatically what GL driver you have and installs the right one. And by right one, I mean we ship the Mesa one internally and then we have support for the NVIDIA one separately. Next question. Yeah. Um, I have a question about uh, what fits into, what's supposed to fit into a flat pack and what's supposed to be in runtime. For example, if I, if I want to have the flat pack with, if that was appropriate, uh, a Perl uh, interpreter, yeah. and then I have an app that depends on the Perl interpreter, do I have to have can one flat pack depend on another flat pack? No, no, you would have to bundle them. Actually, like, and, and this is somewhat common, is that you have a framework you want to depend on for multiple apps, uh, and the really common one is Electron. Like, all this apps bundle Electron, just like the uh, Chrome as a built my desktop app using Chrome with no Chrome. And, and, and the way you don't want to do that is by having a Chrome or an Electron runtime, because then that runtime would be you know, required to up, do the updates in GLibc and whatnot. So what it, we instead did there is say, basically you create an app with Electron in it, and then you can sort of derive from that app and add your stuff. Okay. So, so, um, so dependency on the build level, but the produced thing will be independent. Okay. Uh, so if uh, I that's one way of doing it. Yeah, maybe. okay. Yeah. I, I can't think of a good follow-up question, so I'll yeah. <laughs> one. Okay, absolutely last question. Okay. Okay, I had several questions, but I'll just do a follow-up on the last one. So, what about Linux standard space? Uh, essentially, it says every distro must have Perl, must have Python, and so on. Must have GTK2, must have uh, all sorts of shit. Yeah, so what, <laughs> what, nobody really any, cares. Any relationship, or is that just... I mean, I mean you, you can definitely make a runtime that is fully LSD compatible, it's just that yeah. LSD tends to be ancient. I just mean, shit. what's your... Um, assuming it was Perl that this person wanted. Yeah. Where does that belong? In the um, distro, in the runtime, yeah. in the app? Right now, I think that right now we, we do have, it's not in there. It is in the SDKs, you can, like, Perl is really, really common in builds, like scripts when you build stuff. But, but it's not currently in, in, the, in, the, in the final runtime. So you would have to bundle that. Uh, I think that is the correct decision, but it does make it more painful to to run or to build Perl apps. Uh, Will that mean there will be uh, ten different instances of Perl in, in several bundles? Yeah. In security updates. Do Perl get security updates? I guess it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, clearly, there, there is a there's a line that has to be drawn something somewhere, and and every pain on either side, like if you put too much in the runtime, then the runtime becomes too large, too much to maintain, and stuff that very few users use will be in there, and, and if you put too little in it, it becomes too much of a pain for app developers. So, right now we have kind of an arbitrary line that we took at some point. I think the future will tell exactly if something should move into it or out of it. Uh, and, and I think we hope to instead make it easy on the build side to bundle things, make the tooling easy to bundle things. And, and hopefully, if the tooling is right and everything is, um, if, if, if builds are 
reproducible enough, then uh, files should be produced what binary identical files, basically. And then you get automatically duplication and sharing that way. All right. But, <laughs> I think. Yeah.